Bible Answers with Dr. Al Garza. All right, welcome back to another edition of Bible Answers Unfiltered. I'm your host, Dr. Al Garza. So I'm going to be doing another uh, brief video. This won't be too long, but uh, uh, another response to uh, Dr. White. Um, I just made a response the other day, and I didn't see this till afterward, after I uploaded and did everything. So uh, I didn't address certain questions that he had in this discussion that he uh, was giving it a kind of a critique, again, of myself and Jason Breda's interview. So I'm going to go ahead and respond to some of these things. Um, I think we're still maybe not completely understanding um, what we're trying to say because I'm giving him what I believe to be an explanation of the verse. Uh, and he's either saying it's not a complete interpretation or an exegete, but we're going to try again. But then he's going to invite me in chat in, into a debate or discussion in which uh, to discuss Hebrews 7. And I'll address that as well. But I want to cover a couple of things here where Dr. White... Uh, starts to critique some things that I'm not sure he understands that this isn't my interpretation uh, alone and that there are other biblical scholars who have the same interpretation uh, which I will gladly demonstrate so let's just see I want you to listen to what he says and then we can kind of go from there so let's let's continue yeah so when when we look at like forms of thought do you see chapter 7 as a good starting point? Chapters and verses, obviously, they're not authoritative. Uh, right. But from your perspective, where does this shift happen from where we're now in the context of 725? Uh, I think, yeah, I think since there were obviously there was no chapter and verses, um, and sometimes chapter and verses can actually not be accurately dividing correctly. Uh, sometimes it, it ends where it should be beginning on certain verses. Um, yeah. But I think dealing, if I understand your question correctly, I think dealing with the priestly aspect, is that what you're referring to, of the Atonement? I think right. uh, looking into uh, going to uh, maybe even chapter, no, not chapter 7, looking at um, verse 18, getting on about the Torah and the law, uh, and drawing even says, in the hope through which we draw near to God. Now, mm -hmm. even in the Greek, it also is expressed this way in other writings and the other parts as, as drawing near in worship, uh, not drawing near like for salvation, but drawing near as in worship yeah. to be, you know, bring God in worship and praise. Um, mm -hmm. So, the, and that's kind of what the coming of nearing is sometimes even looked at as, is therefore he's able to save forever those who draw near, come near to God in the sense of intercession, those who seek help from him, those who come to him for that way. So I think... You could start just before that and then bring it. Oh, okay. There, it was very difficult to understand. There, there seemed to have been some assertions um, in this presentation that what you actually have in Hebrews is that you actually have people who claim to be Christians who were still involved in temple worship. Um. There, there didn't seem to be an understanding that the, you know, the, the great sin referred to in Hebrews, I think in, in 1 John, um, is offering sacrifice, is going back to the old ways. And that this was, that the only way you could be allowed to do that if you had claimed to be a Christian would be to curse Christ. So the, the idea that he's actually writing to people who were claimed to be Christians, but they were still involved in temple worship is just way out there. I mean, you know, maybe that, like I said, I don't know if this, if, if Dr. Garza was the source of his Romans is written to Jewish Christians until chapter 11 stuff, I, I don't know. That, again, completely outside the mainstream of anything I find it absurd. I can't believe anyone could ever defend it in, in debate. So let me address the first part. When I uh, decided to talk to Jason about uh, those who come to God and worship through him and he's living to make intercession uh, or to be pleading 
for them or for the sake of them. This is not just my interpretation. Uh, he's asking for interpretation, and he heard my interpretation. He's saying that's way far out there. So this is conclusion interpretation is based on biblical exegesis and how we look at the text, uh, how we understand the Old Testament sacrifices obviously were not to take away sin. They were not uh, to give eternal life. They were basically to reconcile with God for sins that were committed so that you would transfer your sins to whatever it is, the animal, whatever it is you're offering, and therefore, you know, you would reconcile and have your communion back with God. So it was to cover the sin, but not take away the sin. So we understand that that was how it was, and they were done by the priest and priestly daily, and uh, he had the high priest that had his duty. We've already went through this in the interview, so I'm not going to go through it again. But what's interesting that when I said they'd come near or draw near to worship, he says, you know, that's completely out there. Um, this is how I did the biblical exodus of Jesus, and this is not just my method, which my conclusion, but this is how we look at it. The verb, which means to approach or to come near, is used prominently in Hebrews to describe the act of approaching God, particularly in worship. Uh, the term signifies a movement toward intimacy in the Greek and communion with God, reflecting on deep reverence and respect. You can see this in Hebrews 4.16, the Greek usage, uh, 10.1, 11.6, 12.18, 20, uh, chapter, 20, chapter 12, verse 18 and 22. Uh, so, and these are parallels with Exodus 16.9 and Leviticus 9.5, where the people, not just the priests, approach God. And you have similar uh, usages uh, in, in the New Testament with John 6.37, John 10.9, John 14.6, and 1 Peter 2.4, um, coming near to God through Christ. So when I said to the act of worship, he says, that's far out there. Uh, that's, if you, if you do, biblical you just take the Greek uh, for the verb approach to come near, and, and you, you look at it through the book of Hebrews, uh, and you see how it's used. It's used primarily in the sense of coming to God in worship as the text. I, in fact, I pulled up my accordance and I did uh, a search on this. Um, and you find the passages starting from 7.14, uh, where actually Hebrews, I'm sorry, Hebrews 4.16. If anyone teaches a different doctrine, does not agree with the sound words of our, uh, that's Timothy, sorry. Let me pump up here. Hebrews 4, 16, let us then with confidence draw near or come near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. There's that coming near for help in time of need. Draw or come near to the throne of God, same Greek word being used. Uh, 725 here, where we see it being used as to come near to God through the Messiah. Uh, Hebrews 10, 1 where it says, uh, for since the Torah has put a shadow of good things to come instead of the form of these realities, I can never be the same sacrifice. They are continually offered every year. Make perfect uh, make perfect those who come near. Again, the coming near there, uh, Hebrews 10, 22, let us draw near, let us come near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with their hearts sprinkled clean with evil, good conscience in our bodies with pure water. Again, coming near to God, uh, worship and reverence again in uh, 11 6 and and without faith it's impossible to please him for whoever would come near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him again the same Greek word being used here uh, that we have the verb come near who, who again 11 chapter 11 verse 6 and without faith it's impossible to please him for whoever come, would come near or draw near to God whoever does must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So again, that's 11.6. So we can go to 12, uh, Hebrews 12.18. For you have not come, you have not come. Uh, sorry, 12.18, here we go. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire of darkness and gloom of tempest, referring to the mountain of God. Again, these are coming near to God in different ways. Um, so these passages... Uh, even in, in 1 Peter 2, 4, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. So this coming near has to deal with also, like I said, in the air, it's, and to use all the book of Hebrews as in the worship and reverence, all these things. He says it's far out there. Uh, 
that's how you do biblical exegesis you, you, and you do hermeneutics. You compare the Greek word, you search it through the, the book of Hebrews and you see how it's used. Uh, so coming near is specifically in the area of worship. So when I used it and I say, and therefore he, Jesus, has the power to save completely. That's how the, you can literally translate it. Uh, and who is the one who has the power to save completely? He has the power, Jesus does. Those who come to God, and I said, in worship through him, since he is always living to make intercession or to be pleading for them or for the sake of them. Now, in a commentary uh, by F.F. F. Bruce, Howley, and Ellison, we have this uh, commentary that says, and this is in the same chapter, he is able for all time to save those who draw near to God through him. Here's, here's what the commentary says. Uh, he says, the meaning of the tense of the verb draw near indicates that those who constantly come to worship God through Jesus Christ are, this, are the same ones he is able to save. Now, why? Because he has an untransferable priesthood. He's able to make continual intercession for us. Uninterruptedly, he can take up our case before God. So there's one source as well. Uh, that is not me only. Uh, you can see the same in here in the Epistle to the Hebrews uh, by Paul Ellingworth. Same thing. In fact, he gets great depth and goes into other sources to prove the point. So this isn't my interpretation of the, those worshiping coming to God. This is, again, how I would interpret it. I agree with that. That's how I find it. And I do exegesis with, of course, looking at the accordance, uh, searching out the terms. Um, we find the word... For it to come near is used in the way of worship and reverence of God. So, is it really that far out there, Dr. White? Uh, it's not my interpretation alone. This is F.F. F. Bruce and the others that I the commentary, Ellingsworth. So I'm not sure why you would make that statement unless you're unaware of how the Greek word is used throughout the book of Hebrews with proper exegesis and doing basic hermeneutics and searching out. So, and let's continue because he's going to make some other comments, and I think it needs to be addressed as well. Uh, the same way as doing the Ephesians 1 thing is only about the apostles, and it's not a Okay, let me address that real quick. He says Romans 8 is in indefensible in regards to who the audience is. And in my last video, I made it clear. Uh, you can look at that because I made a strong point of we don't start in Romans 8. We start in Romans 7, verse 1. That's the transition. I'm speaking to those who know the Torah. Every commentary will tell you that the Greek word... Is, is the same word they use for the Hebrew Torah. Uh, so he, Paul is now saying, I'm speaking to you Torah Jews, or you are your Hellenistic Jews. Remember Romans chapter 2, he talks about Hebrew and Greek Jews and how the Gentiles do not have the Torah. Okay, they don't have it, they don't know it, but consciously they do the things of the Torah, but they don't have it or know it. So Paul transitions from 7, one Romans 7.1, I'm speaking to you, the, or those who know the Torah. And remember, no chapter verses. He flows until around verse 11, where he transitions to, I'm speaking to you Gentiles. I believe it's in 11, 13. Um, and then he talks about the grafting in. But all 7, 8, 9, 10, and even into 11 are all Old Testament references, quotations, uh, word usages that are found in the Old Testament, adoption of sons, four new all elect, all these things are Jewish terms found in the Hebrew scriptures for Israel, and that's the context. Is it can't defend it? Dr. White, tell me what 7 1 means. You can interpret 7 1 of who Paul's speaking to until you get to around 11 13, I believe, where now he says I'm speaking to the Gentiles. He talks about the grafting in, the context of that. So, again, I'm not sure why he likes to start at 8. He ignores 7 1. Uh, he has never addressed it, and I've never known know him addressing it. So, again, I'm asking. He wants to know it's indefensible. Uh, I'm giving him the verse 7 1. I have commentaries by other, uh, you know, Messianic Jewish believers on the, on the Jewishness of, of Romans, the background of Romans. You have, again, I mentioned for the end of Acts, uh, in, in Acts chapter 28, uh, starting towards the top, I believe, uh, it talks about how Paul in Rome. Uh, calls in for the Jewish leaders, witnesses to them, talks to them about the gospel, talks to them about the Messiah. So there are definitely Jews in Rome because Paul calls them and, and discusses and tries to witness to them, bring them the gospel. 
So is it so Romans has three audiences here. We have the Jews, we have the Greek Jews, and we have Gentiles. And you have to look for the transitions where Paul starts to uh, speak to different groups or references different groups. It's not that difficult. This is basic hermeneutics and basic exegesis. So I'm not sure why this is a problem for Dr. White again, but I want you to continue listening. Anybody else? And you know, all these, let's go way outside of what anyone has ever understood these texts to be talking about. Uh, kind of kind of things, you know, when reform, when anti-reformed people have to do that, eventually you start getting the idea, huh, I wonder if they're doing that because they have to. And the answer is, yeah, they have to. That's, that is the problem. Um, so I'm not sure, but there were some really weird things being said. But um, what was just said was, well, there's different kinds of drawing near to God. Um... And, and I'm, I'm like, um, okay, so in Hebrews chapter 7, it's not talking. The, one of the things that they do is they try to say, and completely misrepresent me in the process, that what I'm emphasizing is who these are who are drawing near to God. That, that's a side issue. I mentioned that in a book because I've had people make it an argument, but that was not my uh, emphasis in in the debate. Hebrews seven twenty five is talking. So we'll get to what he's talking now in his book, which I have here, and I've already referenced it. But I want to say this one part because it is an essential part to what he's trying to say. On page two thirty nine, he's talking about uh, he's finishing up his conclusion. Oh, no, I'm sorry. On page two uh, two forty one in the section of the testimony of the Hebrews, towards the end, he says, Christ makes intercession for those who draw near to God through him. Okay, we agree with that. The question I guess we have to ask is, who are the ones who come near or draw near to God? Uh, I gave you my view, uh, biblical exegesis, following how Hebrews uses that word in the Greek. Uh, and how it, it always points to being worship or giving God reference and honor. The white says, these are the elect. Again, okay, so that's, what's the elect? Well, you ask a reformer, a Calvinist reformer to define elect, he's going to give you, of course, their interpretation of what the elect is. You know, I, and he's already done this before. You can read any Calvinist. It's, it's a different understanding of the elect, how we would look at the elect in the Old Testament, the people of Israel. But he says, these are the elect, John 6, 30, and he references John 6, 37, makes the same point. He intercedes only for them, not for anyone else. So who is he interceding for, according to Dr. White? The elect. So according to Dr. White's interpretation, uh, he has the power to save completely those who come to God. Who are those who come to God? The elect. Those are the ones he makes intercession for, for them, for those. Because he's drawing in that this is specifically for that God is saving those elect. And he's making intercession. Again, basic, basic principle of hermeneutics. Again, um, Jesus has the power to save completely. Who? Those who come to God. I said into worship, F.F. F. Bruce, others, Cowley and others say the same thing. And since he's always living to make intercession or to be pleading for, who? For them. The ones who are coming near to God for the sake of them in the Greek. So there's not much. Uh, that's an interpretation that I'm that I'm staying with, uh, and that I've mentioned to Jason about. Uh, it's more sound. It's more consistent with the Book of Hebrews as a whole, referencing the Greek word to come near, uh, and who yes, Jesus has the power to save. We understand that. That's not disputed. But it's who is he saving? Who are the ones in the Book of Hebrews that he's referring to? As I said before, Jews, which he referenced, who are unbelieving Jews or believing Jews. Again, that's another question we can d discuss, okay? Because we can discuss if these are Jews continue their offerings and their sacrifices because they want to maintain their closeness to God, not realizing that it is that the final sins are done, the atonement, all that is done one time. And so it's a different application here. So again, uh, Let's hear else we has to say. About Christ's ability to save. I am reformed. 
I believe, excuse me, I believe God has the ability to save perfectly. Father, Son, and Spirit together do so perfectly. Nobody disagrees with that. Nobody has a problem with that. I'm not sure why he's emphasizing we know it's, it, that Jesus has the power to save completely. Uh, the, the, the difference is how does he save? Is it by the reform view that he has to bestow on you the, the gift of grace in order for you to have faith? Or do we come to the saving faith? Or we, do we choose to receive the, the grace and of God and put our faith and trust, our trust in Jesus, in Yeshua? Uh, that is what we are debating. Ultimately, the work is done. He's done it. It's there. Sin and death have been in the respect of the resurrection have been done conquered uh so jesus himself is the first fruit of the resurrection sin and death no longer exist with him and so th that respect those who put their faith and trust in him and that gospel message will be saved this is the consistency throughout scripture and so this is why in verses 7 in hebrews 7 23 and 24 and 25 the priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office but he Jesus holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. And therefore, he has the power to save completely who, those who come to God in worship, remember these, these are the Hebrew Jews that, that Paul is referring to, through him, through Jesus. Since he's always living to make intercession, to be pleading, to be pleading for the sake of them. So, again, proper exegesis, looking at how the word is used in the book of Hebrews, the consistent usage and understanding of the word is coming to God in worship and reverence and all those things. Um, it's not that difficult. It's it's easy to understand. You don't have to do what he's going to say, grammar, syntax, all. No, no, no. It's, it's consistent with the reading, consistent how the words use, basic hermeneutics and basic exegesis. I just read how he believes this is the elect. In his book, he says these are the elect and those are the ones he can make intercession for. That's his interpretation as a Calvinist. There's no elect in here. That's what he believes. So he wants to believe that that's who God is saving, the elect. And that's who he's making intercession for, the elect. So but let's continue. And the first assertion of the text is sozain dunita, able to save. He is able to save ice top unto us completely. So the focus is on Christ. The focus is never leaves Christ. The focus is completely upon his capacity, his ability. And if they have read me or listened to me and think that I'm trying to shoehorn the elect into the verse, you've completely blown it. You have no idea what I'm talking about. Well, again, we just read that he said these are the elect, and that is who Christ is making intercession for, the elect. So that's, how he's in, that's his interpretation. I understand what he's saying about he just has the power to save completely. He is able to save completely. We both believe that. I believe that, but it's how he's doing it. It's how is it being done? Is it through the uh, the definition of elect from a Calvinist perspective, like I just defined, or the other way? Again, this goes back to, and I said this before, and I'll say it again to Dr. White. Paul's teaching and training from the house of Hillel does not teach the, the concept of the elect the way you define it or the way Calvinists reform define it. It is foreign to the house of Hillel. Paul was from was trained by at the feet of Gamaliel. He was a Pharisee, remained a Pharisee, he says in Acts, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. He he would not have uh, uh, conceded to your view of elect interpretation for tulip and all those things. It is foreign to the house of Hillel. They believed as a Pharisee that man has the ability to choose to believe and trust in God, to follow God, and that God's foreknowledge and his plans are done in between those, and therefore it will be done. So in other words, God foreknows all, but choice is given. 
They bring both sides together, but not for salvation, where God has to give grace. No, the Pharisees, house of hell, they never believed that. They believed it was our choice to make to either receive and accept the God of Israel, to follow him, and at that time to bring our sacrifice, to atone, to ask for forgiveness, to bring our relationship before Messiah. This has nothing to do with how Dr. White interprets it. I'm sorry. Um, but let's continue. None. So, so they're the ones that are, that are doing, well, you know, maybe it's uh, coming to God in worship. Is what, no, coming to God in praise. I think the text is about the ability of Christ. The text is about the ability of Christ. What, what can he do? How is this related to the concept of priesthood? How is this related to the concept of intercession? That's what this is all about. We need to hear from you a clear, unambiguous, and since you guys don't like the term exegesis, interpretation of what is being said in this text. So I just gave you the interpretation. I just cleared it up. I gave it to you from commentaries. Uh, you can look this up in any of these commentaries. Look, at it's, it's, again, this is not a one interpretation done by Dr. White. Again, he, he's bringing in, Jesus is the one who does the saving. We agree with that. He did it by offering himself as a sacrifice for sin, death, burial, resurrection. The work is done and complete. Now the question is, what is the process of receiving or believing or putting our faith and trust in him? Is it by the Calvinist point of view of God giving grace to those he's elected and some for them and some and not some from others? Or is it open to all to bring and receive the gift of God? And if we do not receive it, our sins are on us. As in the Old Testament, if we didn't bring our, our sacrifice, we didn't believe in the God of Israel, then our sins are on And the nation's the same way. Uh, it's open. That's why I said in the Old Testament, foreigners and the, not just proselytes, foreigners, soldiers can come in. They can participate if they believe in the God of Israel and they wanted to give offerings. They could the way it's instructed by God. It was, it was inclusive in the Old Testament. Those who wanted to come freely, even from among the nations, that they can come in and do it if they would believe in the God of Israel. That's how it's done today with the Messiah, whose one sacrifice, sins removed. We come to him, we come to God through him. Just like this in the book of Hebrews, where they were still bringing offerings and sacrifices, saying, you know, worshiping God, bringing their offerings, all those things. Again, coming to God, that's how it's understood. The Greek word is used that way. Not for salvation's sake, but for worship, to come before him. As I just we just looked at, I mean, there's so many passages Specifically, the you know, um, and in Hebrews eleven six, and without faith, it's impossible to please him. For whoever would come near, same Greek word, to God, whoever would come near to God, we must be, must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. That's the condition. So, we can play this all day long. Um, he's actually going to bring up a challenge, which I'll continue to play. Don't worry about all the rest of this stuff. Answer what the text is referring to. Okay, that's that's what needs to be done here, and we're we're not we're not we're not getting that, um, unfortunately. Down 23, 24, 25, That that now coming into what the new covenant and what that means and so forth, and then what the sacrifices are are not able to do anymore. So I think yeah, you could start a little bit before twenty seven, and then or I'm sorry, twenty five, and then work your way down. I don't think the main point of the text and correct me if I'm wrong, is what James brings out in his interpretive fashion is those who draw near. I don't think that's the main focus on... Jason? I, I, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? That's not what I brought up in the debate. That's not what I've ever... I've, I've preached on this text. I've debated this text. I've written on this text. One time... In the Potter's Freedom, I deal with objections from other people. That doesn't make that my focus. I never said it. Jason, you don't have any idea what I'm saying. You've not heard the question. I don't know how to get you to hear it. 
Everybody else can hear it. Everybody at the debate heard it. Well, except for a few people that came with their own prejudices. But um, I, this was very frustrating to hear this. My emphasis consistently has been that this text teaches Jesus' ability to save completely is directly connected to his indestructible life because he now ever lives to make intercession for them. Hebrews 6, I, I preached on this just recently. He is our forerunner. He's gone into the holy places in our place to represent us in the presence of God. He is that anchor of the faith that goes through the veil. I don't know how to make it any clearer. I really don't, and I don't know why you're not hearing it. I, I you know, my, my prayer is you'll start hearing it, uh, but you're not you're not hearing it now. The text uh, is, you know, from a salvific standpoint. Right. Um, I think it's the focus is Jesus is the better high priest, and. And yes, you, we do need it. We can come to Jesus because of what he has done. And I think the point is that those... What, what, what do you mean? Of course he's a greater high priest. We're talking about the Melchizedek priesthood here. We're talking about he goes into the heavenly realms. The, the, the high priest is prevented by death from continuing. He, he's only in the tabernacle. He's not in, in the heavenly realms. There's, there's all these contrasts that are made. Better covenant, better high priest. Yeah, that's true. But in this text, the issue is his ability to save. Did you just say it's not about salvation? What does Sodzine mean? I, I, it's, it's really hard. It, it would have been, can you, Jason, by yourself, without bringing somebody else in, can you, walk through this text. I know you can't walk through it in the original language. Leave that aside. Le use whatever ESV, NASB, LSB, whatever you like. Walk through it and explain how the language is consistent. What, what is the relationship between Christ's intercession and his ability to save completely? Because your theology has a chasm between the two. You have, do you have Christ interceding? Who do, who's Christ interceding for? Who's Christ interceding for? And He's interceding for those who come to God in the book of Hebrews to worship. You've got to remember that there were people in the Old Testament and in the New Testament who knew the God of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel, uh, Cornelius, and, and others, uh, who didn't know Jesus yet, didn't hear the gospel, but were still worshiping, believing in the God of Israel, doing all these things. And when they heard the gospel message, they believed. Uh, but they were still worshipers of the God of Israel. They were still bringing their... their uh, their offerings and their tithes or their alms and all these things and when they heard the gospel through Jesus they were saved and so yes he is able to save those who come to God in this in this text in Hebrews and worship through him um, since he's always living the intercession to those uh, intercession for them who the ones being pleading for the sake of them he's pleading he's intercession for them I mean we can talk about sozo and how it's used, so Zain, I used to Pantele, Sinatai, Sozo used, uh, common in the Synoptic Gospel, common in Acts, uh, specifically uh, used with uh, Dunamai, which is to be able to, another word uh, similar uh, to linguistic pairing. Uh, it's also noticed in Paul's, uh, in, uh, Paul and James, Mark 15, 31, 10, 26, Acts 15, 1, James 1, 12. Uh, again, this is dealing with the power to grant complete and eternal salvation. Uh, Hebrews 2.18, 5.7, cross-reference 10.1, having the power to save. Uh, we can look at this again. It, it, however you want to look at it in the Greek, Pantelis Dunatai, how it's used in the Gospels and Acts, how it's used uh, with sozing, uh, well, the, the, the root word sozo. So, 
we can do this. It's not a big deal. Uh, you, again, you have to examine the whole. And, and, and Dr. White knows this. It's not just reading a verse and then trying to make it say what you want. As I said, he believes it's the elect. It's in his book. He emphasizes it. He makes emphasis of, of the other passages and John and all that. So intercession is for them. It's, it's, the question is, who is them? I gave you my interpretation of those who come to God and how those come to God, the verb is used. And then you can do it as you will, but it's not going to satisfy Dr. White. There's, there is no correct answer for him. You, what I think you know, or at least those who are trying to help you prepare this date know, there is an absolute connection between the intercessory work of the high priest and the sacrificial work of the high priest. It's the same audience. So if the intercessory work is for a specific people, then the sacrifice is for a specific people. The intercession result, results in their perfect salvation. The sacrifice results in their perfect salvation. You have particular redemption. You've got to try to avoid that because you don't believe it. So I know, like I said, I'm not sure what he's talking about perfect salvation sacrifices. The Old Testament is, was not for salvation. Uh, it was not given. Uh, the, the animals could not take away sin, obviously. The Old Testament, like I just said, it was for the covering of sin. And I made an illustration of taking dirt in your house and sweeping it under a rug to cover it up so you don't see it. It's still there, but you covered it. That's what the offerings and the sacrifices were about. The once a year, the daily offerings for sin. And if you didn't bring your offering, even for an unintentional sin or you weren't even sure, you still bring an offering. But even for those sins, you bring... And if you didn't bring it, the sin is bared on you and you bring the judgment of God upon you. And then you have for the people of Israel, for the high priest and himself and his home, once a year. And if you were an outsider and you wanted to do it and you wanted to put you believe in the God of Israel, you, you can. It was inclusive. It was had to be a choice. You had to choose to do so. The New Testament now, it is your choice to believe and receive the Messiah as the final sacrifice for your atonement of sins Period. You don't have to wait to a special grace to come. Anybody can come now to the Messiah and trust and put your faith and trust in Him if you're willing to. We know people, not everybody will. We know that. And it's not because God has passed over them or doesn't choose to elect them for whatever purpose of His glory to show His judgment. Dr. White wants to say those people are to show God's judgment, the others to show God's mercy and grace. It Again, if you if you really put it down to what he's trying to say or what any Calvinist is trying to say, that makes no sense. In the sense of saying, God can do it, but he's not going to because he has to show his wrath and judgment. And he does it over here so he can show his grace and mercy. So it works perfectly. Though they have no choice, so they're created to be damned and be judged by God. So that God can show that, he's, that he brings judgment. Rather than... Following the Gospels, following Paul and his training from the house of Hillel, following Jesus and putting the, putting the blame on the Pharisees and leaders that it's by their heart, their mouth, they do things according against God and Torah and the Moses. They don't follow it and judgment comes on them because they refuse to believe and to put their trust in him and to accept him. And they don't follow Moses and the prophets. If they, if they did, they would know who he is. So all these things... Uh, in the new in the gospels shift the blame right back to the individual and it's not because God is not giving him the grace or chooses so he can show that that's all interpretation adding into the text you have to put that as a Calvinist you have to uh, deductively look at the text from that view of a Calvinist and then insert it it's not there it is not there I, it, it, it just you really have to stretch for this and so the Old Testament sets clear of how the sins were not permanently removed but covered, and it was a choice to do so. Same in the New Testament. Doesn't change. You don't believe it. Here's the problem. Um, the Scripture teaches it, and I can simply trust the Spirit of God to cause Christ's sheep to see the truth about Christ in Christ's word. You know, if someone wants to reject that, I might go about it, um, but I can have confidence uh, that Christ's sheep will hear his, his voice. Who come 
um, as we as we see in verse 25, he's able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. And and this is where I think the the Calvinist inserts well the only the question was how does the end of the verse relate to the beginning of the verse? You just said he's able to save those who gone near God perfectly because he ever lives to make intercession for them. Right? So what does that mean? What does that mean? The reason they come to God, as like you mentioned what James does, is they have to go to other portions of Scripture like John 6, um, Romans 8. Romans 8. Okay, what they're talking about, again, they're not talking about the debate. Um, they're talking about the fact that in, I believe it was the Potter's Freedom, and I don't even remember if it was in the text or in a footnote. I dealt with... It was in the text. We just read it. That's how he interprets it. It's right there. Objection that people have made, and you can find it in numerous places, um, where they try to insert into the ability to come to God through him some kind of capacity. And I demonstrated that this is, goes against the overall biblical teaching. That's all I was doing. I wasn't making it a part of my argumentation. I didn't make it a part of the argumentation of the debate. It is a canard. It's a side issue. And it, it just, again, you, you either have to be dishonest or you're just not listening. I'm not well, we're listening, but it's, it's not about being dishonest. We're listening. You, you insert the word elect in your book, and you did. You say, this is the elect, those he's making intercession for. And we would say, it's unclear, but using the whole of Scripture, just like you said, we would come to the conclusion that these are the ones who come based on Hebrews, those who worship through him. That's what F.F. F. Bruce and others believe, Ellingsworth. This is not just my interpretation. This is a scholarly uh you know, belief that that's how it's understood. It's not speaking the way a Calvinist wants to interpret it. He's living, again, these are speaking to Jews in its historical cultural context of those Jews bringing offering and sacrifices. And I believe that they were probably believing Jews still bringing their offering sacrifices for whatever reason. Uh, and, and, and Paul's basically explaining to them that it is Jesus who has saved completely and he's making a statement here based on verse 23 and 24, those who come to God and worship through him, he has the power to save completely. It's done. Since he's always living to make intercession and to be pleading for them, for the sake of them. And that's why later on he'll talk about the one sacrifice and all those things, but it's not a one sacrifice here. It's a continuous intercession. So it's based upon what they were doing at that time. Plain commentary plain interpretation doesn't take that much he's being dishonest so he's just not listening he's not hearing this is this is a canard this is we're not going to answer the actual question we're going to throw all the rest of this stuff out and the fact of the matter is these guys have an anthropology just because they're pretending they don't well we don't have a system we're not reading anything to this baloney you bet you do you bet you do that's why if you will put out a positive interpretation, I'll show you how your system is determining what you're saying. So I just gave an interpretation and uh, uh, how scholars interpret it. Basically, from the Greek, from a, from a scholastic point of view, the Greek text emphasizes the action and its means through Jesus without explicitly limiting the scope of who can undertake this action. So we got to ask, is this available to all or only to a specific group? As Dr. White has said, the elect. We maintain it's available to all as the Old Testament uh, sacrifices and offerings and all that was available to those who would come to the house of Israel, those of, of Israel, and anybody who wanted to come in into, as individuals. New Testament, the same thing. So again, this is the Greek, how the Greek emphasizes it. It's not telling you explicitly who it's who, how, basically, or the means, uh, just what's taking place in the action form. So we look at it that way, and Dr. White looks at it his way. The whole of Scripture will give us a different interpretation. And again, Paul's training. Who 
how he was trained and what he understood. Since he's the one who is who I say authored it in Hebrew. As I mentioned, we have six or seven Hebrew New Testament manuscripts uh, that are newly discovered in the last few years. I have them. We can uh, that's easy to look at, um, and we can see from there. So, but again, this is this is an interpretation. I, we just gave you one. It'll be easy to do. Um, so, yeah, anyway. To say they can only come to God if they've been granted regeneration so that they now can believe. Yeah, if they're given and, the grace to be regenerated, right? Yeah. Right. And obviously, I just, that's nowhere in this explicit text. So we might need to hop over to John and also to Romans just so people uh, that maybe are maybe back and forth, one foot in, one foot out. They don't. They don't know how to do this. Right. Uh, it might be good to uh, hop over there. Yeah, and I, and I think you're right. There's there's no reason in the text here. Uh, I I just guess they can't answer the question or refuse to answer the question. I don't get it. Um, what's the relationship? Once you establish a relationship your position will collapse. So it's just like, well, let's go someplace else. Um, and, you know, as much as I would like to go those other places, that wasn't my argumentation. And I can most assuredly uh, deal with John 6. I, in fact, I did recently. What was, oh, yeah. <laughs> and I can go to Romans 8. I mean, these are great places to go. So here's what I'll do. Rather than spend more time, we're already at an hour and a half, um, well, with a little break and a little bit of silence in there. Um, here's what I'd like to do. Um, with, with all due respect to Jason, um, you're, you're, you, you've gotten into some areas that you're just you're not prepared to deal with. And the very fact that instead of offering your own interpretation, you had to go with somebody else, uh, demonstrates it. So, Dr. Garza. Um, when I get back from this trip, hopefully, um, I'm going to be facing surgery. I don't know how long that's going to take. I don't know what kind of results we're going to get. I, I, I don't know right now. Um, but let's say the, the Lord is gracious to me, and it's one surgery, and it's done, and, you know, I had this problem seven and a half years ago, so I'll be in my 70s uh, if I get that amount of time again. Who knows? Uh, so, but uh, we have a we have a large platform here, and so what I'm doing is I am inviting you. What we'll do is we will put we we will basically. Um, do this. I will. Um, oh, whoops, going the wrong direction. We will put the text on the screen. Sort of like, uh, sort of like this. And you and I will give an original language-based interpretation. You call it what you want. I mean, I thought you guys just got really sort of goopy with uh, all the stuff that you did. Call it what you want. Um, I will explain to people what the argument of Hebrews chapter 7, and if you want, um, how about we, we can start, you're, you're an old OT guy, we can, we can start with you know, Psalm 110, if you want, uh, 720, um, you know, any, where, 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 where do we want to start up here in chapter 7? Um, we'll, we'll, we'll choose the place, but we'll have to include 7, 24, and 25. We can go down to, uh, we can go down to chapter 8 if we want to. Whatever. But we will deal with the text directly. And 
Each one of us will have, what, 15 minutes, maybe, to make an opening presentation on the meaning of the text. And then we would need to go into cross-examination. And the first one who presented uh, would have to answer questions from the other side. Why did you say this about this? What does this form mean to you? Um, what is the syntactical category of this participle? And then reverse. So the other side has to answer the same question. And then maybe 10 minute um, conclusions uh, after that. So let's do Hebrews 7. If you want to do John 6, Romans 8, you, want, you really want to go to Romans 8? You want to do the golden chain? Um, okay. I mean, talk about seeding the ground, but okay. Uh, that's, that's certainly useful uh, and helpful. So let's do it. Let's see who can handle the text consistently without running off over here, running off over there. Uh, who can handle the text consistently? So there's my invitation. So uh, let me know what you think. I'm easy to get hold of on in social media. Uh, you can uh, give Rich a call and provide information as to how we can set something like this up. And uh, we can, it would probably be best to do it in our big studio in, uh, in Phoenix uh, when I am physically able to do so anyways. Um, because that way we've got the big screen so we can use that uh, to, to look at and uh, put you up on uh, a big screen next to it and make it work out. Uh, so I think, that's, I think that's the best way to handle this. So uh, I'll be looking forward to hearing from you uh, as to when you would be willing to uh, engage. First, we, we need to do Hebrew 7. That was what this was supposed to be about. That's what the issue in the debate was about. Um, you, your emphasis seems to be in Hebrew language issues. Um, I would want to find out from you if you think that there is a Hebrew language original to refer to. I don't believe so. Uh, I believe Paul preached Hebrews to the Hebrew believers, but the first time that it came into existence as a written text is what we have. And it was written in a very classical form of Greek. Luke is Luke, Acts, and Hebrews. Same form of Greek. Very most classical Greek in the New Testament. It's it's barely Koine. It has such a strong uh, classical emphasis to it. Um, so that's what I think we should do, and that's my invitation uh, to you to uh, to do that. And we will. We will see what you what you have to say uh, about that. Um, so, let me see here. There it is. Um, so there you go. We've done uh, an hour and. Okay, so I ran that so you can hear the whole thing. I didn't want to cut anything short. Um, of course, he wants to have a debate on this topic. I'm not sure what there is to debate about at this point. Um, because we're not going to agree on the interpretation. Uh, the Greek is not going to help either one of us so much syntactically looking at how verbs are used and all. I mean, it's matter of interpretation. I've already given you scholarly source interpretation that he's not going to agree with because, again, from his book, he believes this is speaking about the elect. Those are the ones who are making intercessions for are the elect. Those who are coming near to God are the elect. And their definition of the elect is not my definition of the elect, going from the Old Testament into the New Testament. Uh, so debating it, I'm not sure how that would go, because it's a matter of interpretation and a matter of, again, I, I would be emphasizing not only the interpretation I just gave you with the scholarly sources behind it and how the word is used, the rest of, of the book of Hebrews coming near, as well as um, those who come near to God in worship, and yes, Jesus has the power to save completely. The question is who and how and all those things. So the other thing that we got to look at as well is 
is my big thing is we have well, put it this way from from my perspective myself and dr white have uh when it comes to these areas we're far apart i don't believe paul at all believed and taught the soteriology that's taught in reformed calvinism historically i would challenge dr white to show me anywhere uh in the teachings of Hillel, which i have many volumes and books of of if how they taught the uh if they taught that type of soteriology where do you find it from that school of thought uh which you will not find it and how paul emphasizes even even certain which i again i wrote a paper on this in academia there is certain areas where you'll see paul emphasize certain things that comes out of the house of Hillel as part of the teaching so the foundation is completely different between us my foundation is paul would have never taught the soteriology of calvinism period so that's the big divide right there so we can argue interpretation methodology greek hebrew grammar syntax her, uh, exegesis hermeneutics all we want but we have two different views of paul two different understandings of paul two different backgrounds of paul uh, and in the New Testament itself with Jesus and the apostles and so forth of this view that, that the Calvinist soteriology view holds. Um, again, my interpretation, I just gave it to you, but I will definitely consider the debate. Um, I have a lot going on. I, I want to say also, uh, I hope, Dr. White, I hope if you're listening, I hope uh, my prayers are with you, my prayers for your health, that the surgery goes well. Uh, we hate to lose someone like you who's uh, you know, done so so much for the body of Christ in the sense of defending the Trinity, uh, going against Muslims, atheists, all those things. So he definitely, my prayers are with you, uh, and I hope you recover quickly and that it's over and done. Um, and I hope you get back safe. And then we can discuss, I guess, uh, the, the, I guess, what would be a debate or even a discussion debate. Even if we have a discussion where you know, we talk about our interpretations and you can ask me questions about it. I can ask you questions about it. more of a discussion, not really formal, kind of, you know, more of a informal if you want. Uh, keep it, keep it, uh, keep it that way. I'm always down for that as well. Um, but we can discuss it. I mean, I'm always open to it. It's just hard because there's so much that I want to draw out within the historical aspects of the New Testament that I think uh, you and I have a big difference on. And yes, my view on the manuscripts that we do have of the book of Hebrews in Hebrew uh, that uh, we have found uh, within the last few years. I have them all. I think there was like six or seven of them. Uh, and they're, most of them are complete. I think there's maybe one that's not, but I'll have to double check. But I think they're all might be complete, um, all complete of the book of Hebrews in Hebrew. So we can, I, I mean, I look at those, I study those because I, 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 I study them, translate uh, and I compare them to the Greek and see how they read together. So it's interesting. But we can talk about that as well. But um, yeah, I'm going to leave it there. Uh, I will get back to Dr. White. I'll get back to you. Uh, when you're when you're ready and you're out of surgery, we can set something up maybe or talk about what we want to do. If, if that's what you want to do, um, I'm always open to have a discussion or a debate of some sort. Um, if you want to discuss this, that's fine. Uh, go beyond that. That's fine. Uh, but again... I think we have more, more division on the foundation of all of this than I think uh, would, would take a lot more time. But listen, thank you for tuning in. I want to thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. White, for the invitation. Again, I hope you get well. Prayers are with you. Uh, but I want to say thank you to everyone listening. Please like, share, and subscribe. Uh, and again, uh, we will talk about this more in the future. This will be one of my final responses to him. And we can kind of wait till he gets uh, gets better. So thank you, God bless, and have a wonderful day. Bible Answers with Dr. Al Garza.